Climbing to new heights is the focus of this next story, too, but this time we are talking rockets. That's right, and the one you're about to see is special because it's being used to test a new biofuel. We follow some professional rocketeers as they labor in the desert heat of California to get that machine to fly. Dusk in the Mojave Desert. At an amateur rocket launch site, there's a late arrival. It looks anything but amateur. Do you have a permit for that missile? Hardly wait to uh, launch this baby. The rocket was designed by Steve Harrington. Basically, what these umbilicals are attached to the ground with a, a rope and a stake, and then when the rocket takes off, they all disconnect like this. Ready? Ouch. See where it's leaking. Steve's company is called Flometrics. It specializes in rocket science. Flometrics has come here before to test new designs, not always successfully. Now they're here to test a fuel made from corn and soybean oil. In January, we tested this basic rocket with uh, biodiesel, and that generated an awful lot of interest in the biofuel industry. So we were able to get some uh, bio jet fuel um, from the University of North Dakota Energy uh, Research Center, the EERC, and we're going to test that fuel tomorrow, and this is the first time that this fuel has been tested in a rocket. Biofuel is renewable and maybe less toxic, but is it as powerful as the kerosene normally used in rockets? Steve thinks so, but he has to test it to be sure. He pressurizes the rocket to look for leaks. OK, so we're going to vent the tanks now. OK, both vent valves work. Steve and his engineers are very good at troubleshooting. Oh, it's off. It's off. They don't know it now, but soon their skills are really going to be put to the test. So with this soapy water, if there's a leak, it'll start bubbling, just like it did right there. You see that one? You want to fix that, baby? Oh, yeah. The tail fins are resin-coated plywood. They're designed to help the rocket fly straight. The engine is a surplus missile maneuvering motor. It bolts on. This is something I learned when I used to skydive. Engineer Carl Tedesco packs the parachute system very carefully. Judy, you want to come over here? Because Steve wants to recover the rocket in one piece. On board, there's a memory chip that'll record how the biofuel affects the rocket's performance. Well, if the parachute doesn't deploy properly, then the rocket crashes into the ground at high speed. In the morning, the forecast warns it's going to be a scorcher, 43 Celsius. So Steve gets an early start working on the launch tower. His hosts, the Friends of Amateur Rocketry, are rising too. Many are here just to see his rocket. First task, the team sets up the 18-meter high launch tower. It must be straight so the rocket flies true. The nose cone goes on, and then it's time for a parade. The rocket is six meters long and weighs about 85 kilos without fuel. It was commissioned by the producers of Mythbusters. They decided they didn't need it. The vent's OK. A lot of care is taken getting it installed just right on the launch rail. The tower is raised, but they need to adjust the position of the rocket. On the way down, the tower vibrates. The welds broke here. There's this metal. Metal fatigue. It's a difficult situation That's it puts good. us in. You know, you need something to, to keep this gap intact. Hey, Steve, what if we had bail clamps that just went around here to here? I don't know if it's strong enough. What if we put a, uh, <laughs> A tie-down. That's what I know. Tie yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So tie-down straps go on. They give it a try, but it's not enough. Uh, uh, back up. <laughs> Keep adding more straps. Eventually, it's going to be enough. And finally. Oh, that's good. Way to go. That's Boy, good. that was a difficult repair there. The rocket is raised. Then. Uh-oh, back guy wire broke. So we have just two guide wires instead of three. There's a certain point where you're no longer nervous because you've seen this happen so many times. Steve decides to go ahead without the guy wire. The rocket is fueled up, and liquid oxygen goes into the rocket to burn the biofuel. Liquid oxygen is almost full. Time to get undercover. In case there's falling debris, people go into the bunkers. Time for one last look. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah, just a typical yeah. day, you know, typical rocket day. Steve takes his place in the bunker at the ignition button. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Oh, we lost a piece of metal. You can see it. The nose cone came off early. No, there's a piece of metal fluttering, too. Yeah. Everybody stay under cover. There's stuff right above us. Yeah. Well, I think it might have gone faster than we planned, <laughs> which means the biofuel went better than we planned. Because we planned to go about Mach 0.93. It's not designed for that type of, of aerodynamic stress. <laughs> <laughs> when it first started fishtailing, that was when the parachute and everything was off then, the fins were off then, and I think that it was just a big old Oscar Mayer wiener. When fin pieces are found, they do look like they were torn off the rocket. Obviously, they exceeded the structural uh, capacity of our plywood fin. <laughs> it takes days to find the rocket. It plowed into the ground nose first. The memory chip with the biofuel performance data is lost, but Steve is still a happy rocket man. I felt really good. Because, I mean, we have gone, been out here so many times and had things go wrong. To have that, that good sound again is good, even though we didn't get it back in one piece. At least he can tell the people who made the biofuel they did a very good job. 